stand for the reading of God's, God's word. word. Matthew, Matthew 13, 13, 31 through 33. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. So if you have Bibles or Bible apps, keep them open there to Matthew 13. We'll be looking um, at those two little parables in the midst of some of the other ones we've been talking about. Let me just give a real brief, broad stroke of what we, where, where we've been and, and where we're going. Um, we're, we're looking at this section of teaching in uh, the, the book of Matthew that is, is, is part of uh, Jesus' words to his young and new and eager disciples and the crowds that are listening in. Uh, even in, through this passage in Matthew 13, you'll see him speaking to the crowds with his disciples kind of at the front forefront. And then he even he talks about them moving into a room where it's just the disciples. And then he does some more explanation and kind of unpacks things for them um, here. So there's, there's that kind of a thing going on. And, and what Jesus is doing is he has come on the scene. Uh, you know, he's, he's lived 30 years of his life and he's began his public ministry uh, he's, he's made some, some, uh, some big claims. He's speaking to spiritual matters of things that are going on in people's hearts. He's, he's doing um, tangible works of miracles. He's seeing people healed. Um, he's doing things like walking on water and, and calming storms. And the disciples are with him through all of this stuff. And they're seeing these amazing things. They're hearing him teach. And they're trying to understand what in the world is all this about. <laughs> They had uh, one view of what uh, life in the God's kingdom would look like when the Messiah came. And Jesus, in so many ways, is, is redirecting some of that. He's saying, actually, this is what life in the kingdom looks like. And these parables are given to us, these stories are given to us to help um, drive home at least one main point that, that, that pierces our hearts, that gets past our outer defenses and really speaks to us on the, the, the deepest parts to change us, to call some sort of action. And, and specifically, these in Matthew 13 are, are kind of shining light on the different facets of this gospel diamond, this diamond of the kingdom, of what, it's, what life is supposed to be like. If we could say it this way, it may be the, the easiest way to understand it is that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, when it's used, that phrase is used in the scripture, it really and truly, all it means is the rule of God. Where the rule of God has, has come uh, to, to take root, to bear fruit, that, that, that is where, um, where his rule is followed, that's where the kingdom has come. And so with Jesus, as the king, as the Messiah, it was wherever he went. <laughs> wherever he went, the kingdom was coming, and they were seeing it <clears throat> in all of these um, spiritual ways, in physical ways, um, healing and all of these all of these things um and yet they're asking this question okay we see what you're doing now and you're telling us you're going to come again what happens in between what life can we expect um you know, you know in this in between life if the disciples uh once they saw jesus crucified and then celebrated him being resurrected and then saw him ascended uh, they would would call to memory the teachings that we have recorded for us in these gospel books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they would share them with one another, and they were like, you know, he told us why he was here, what we could expect. And now us, 2,000 years later, are asking the same questions. God, we know you came in Jesus 2,000 years ago, and you did this unbelievable thing of accomplishing salvation for us. And we have your promises that you're coming again one day to complete the work. And yet what we see in front of us right now is an absolute mess. <laughs> How are we to live in between your first coming and your second coming? And so we can go to the same place the disciples went. We can go back to his words, his teachings, where he actually gives us the keys to that. He says, look, this is what it's going to be like. This is what you can expect. 
And just like for them, it was different than the, what their perceptions were. It was a new normal is what he's describing for us. It's going to be the same for us. Our world and the world that we grow up in kind of tells us what we can expect. What is the normal? And Jesus over and over redirects that. He says, no, 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 no. You say, you've heard it said, but I say to you. And that's what he's doing here again in these kingdom parables. So what we've talked about the last two weeks is it's, it's got a flow to it. His teaching's got it builds on, on one another. He talked the first week about the sower, the parable of the sower. And the main message of that parable was there's going to be all kinds of challenges for the kingdom word to go out. And yet, the surprising thing about it is in the midst of all of those challenges, it's going to be unbelievably fruitful. And so you start to think, well, okay, well, he says even in the midst of challenges, it's going to be fruitful. But, man, when I look out, all I see is, 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 is chaos. And it seems like there's more weeds than there is wheat. There's more weeds than fruit. And he says, well, let me tell you a story about that. And he tells them the story of the wheat and the weeds. And he says, it's, it's going to look like there's no one in control. And you're going to have the tendency to want to take control of things. And fear things out on your own. And he said, you've got a calm and confident king who owns this field, who's not surprised by the schemes of the evil one. And there's going to be wheat and weed growing up together. But don't worry. Trust me. It'll all be made right in the end. And in the middle of it all, I'm still king. I'm still sitting on my throne. And so then you say, okay, well, if there's going to be unbelievable fruit. And yet it's going to be mixed. It's going to look mixed as it grows up together. Then, then what does that kingdom look like for me? How, how can I get at it? What, what will it? How will it work itself out? And that's where these two little parables come in. They're right in the middle of his telling the parable of the wheat and weeds and explaining it. He gives these two little parables right in the middle of it to kind of give some color, some other input and advice in the middle of it. And so here's what we're going to talk about today. The kingdom is extensive. It reaches into every place. It's intensive. It touches every part. And then it's upside down. It's going to cause us to rethink all that we thought was normal. So let's look at it very quickly this morning. First, the kingdom of God, as it grows up and bears this unbelievable fruit, even in the midst of what looks like chaos with a calm and confident king, it's going to be extensive. It's going to go out and touch and reach every place of God's great creation. Think about the disciples. They had no idea of what this small start with those 12 guys and their, their compatriots was going to grow into. That it was going to, this, re, this religion, this following this person of Jesus and, and the truth, the good news that he came to bring was going to spread to every part of the world. We're, we're actually an example of that. You know, if you think about it, we, we always in America tend to think of ourselves in the center of the world and everybody else as the ends of the earth. But that's not how the Bible described it in Acts. It said, take the gospel from Jerusalem, and then to Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Guess where the ends of the earth was when he made that comment? It was us. And so the fact that we're gathering for worship here this morning in Nashville, Tennessee, is a fulfillment of that promise. That God has done that. It reached to every place, even us. And yet the work is not done. They had no idea that small start would grow into this great Great picture. picture. The picture he gives here. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. You, can you see the callous farmer's hands? I grew up on a farm. I, you know, I, I dealt with farmers most of my life. There's these hands of work, and you've got in the middle of it, have you ever seen a mustard seed? This little tiny dot of a seed. This may be not the smallest seed known to man, but it, it definitely um, what, it was understood back then, representative to be the smallest thing you can think of, this little dot of a seed. And what does he do? He takes it, and he, it says here, a seed. He puts it in, in the ground, and what it does is it grows up into a, a bush, a tree that can be uh, from like 12 to 18 feet. No, 8 to 12 feet in, in the, biggest, the biggest ones of it. So not huge, not a, an evergreen that you see, you know, not a, a red wood, but it's, it's a... It's, it's a, at least a bush that birds can come and dwell. It's so much bigger than its small starts you'd have ever have thought. That's what he's saying. It's going gonna, it's gonna to spread. It's going to grow. His rule is going to spread to every place. It's speaking of here what we know of as the, the, the Great Commission, where, where God's word is going to go to the ends of the earth. Three things we want to say about this. Um, the extensiveness, the fact that the gospel is going to reach every 
place, the kingdom is going to reach every place, is a fulfillment of the promise of old. It's not a new thing that God was doing in the sense of brand new and never thought of before. It was actually a fulfillment of what God had promised way back in Genesis 1 and 2. Way back in Genesis 1 and 2, and we, we might go ahead and say Genesis 1 through 3, where God gave Adam and Eve the promises of what? He says the commission of be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He put them in this place in Eden, and, and not only just in Eden, but in a garden in Eden. And he said, this is what my rule looks like in perfection. You've got each other. You've got all you need for food. And you've got me in my presence walking with you in the cool of the day. You've got everything you need. This is perfect. Now go take this, be fruitful, and multiply and fill the earth with it. And we know the rest of the story, right? Instead of doing that, they filled the earth, but they filled it with what? With sin, with rebellion, with corruption. Doing things their own way. Taking the reins for themselves. Trying to, to overthrow God. Set themselves up as, as God. And, and yet, you know, the, the, the commission actually continued. It just continued with sin as part of the picture. So they did. We did. We've done a great job of filling this earth. We've just filled it. With corruption, with sin-sick hearts, with people that are, are rebellious against God. And so when Moses writes Genesis to the, the, the initial hearers, the initial recipients of, of his writings, what were they doing? They were asking the question, God, how did things get so messed up? And so Moses was like, let me tell you the story. It's because of you and me. We messed it up. We filled it with all of our sin and rebellion. And so we need a rescuer. We need a Messiah who's going to come and represent rightly. Who's going to, in every way that we failed, he's going to succeed. He's going to take care of the problem of sin in our own hearts. And so when Jesus comes and he announces that, when he says, I've come, and because of I've come, I'm coming to, to preach this message, repent, turn, because the kingdom of God is at hand, he was saying the long-awaited rescuer is here. And now things are going to be different. There's going to be a different trajectory. And then when he accomplishes salvation with his, his, his crucifixion and resurrection, he, he then commissions the disciples to do what? The same thing that was back in Genesis 1 and 2. To go, therefore. In other words, take up that commission from long ago and yet now do it in my strength and power with the salvation that I have purchased and accomplished. So it's this fulfillment of the promise of old that this kingdom would reach to every place. Secondly, it's the job of the church. It's the job of the church. When I say church, you, you might have a, a couple of different things in your head. Because when we say church, we could mean one of two things and sometimes both of them. There's the organized church, right? The church of the institution, uh, and then there's the organic church, right? The church of the people of God. Um, I, we used to say it this way, right? Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door, and there's the people, right? Did y'all ever do that growing up? And I had a friend in, in, uh, in college say, no, 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 that's wrong. It should be, here's the church building, and here's the steeple of the church building. Open the doors, and there's the church. What was he trying to say there? He said, we're the church. It isn't necessarily dependent on a building. We're grateful. That the Lord's provided this building for us. But we met in a school and in a brewery or two breweries and in different places during COVID, right? It's not dependent on that. It's, it's us. So there's this organized part, this institution of the church, and then there's the people of the church. And both of those, it's the job to see that the gospel of the kingdom goes out to reach every place in the world until Jesus comes back. So the, the organized part of the church produces programs and a movement of God's people towards that end. And then the, the organic, the, the individual um, parts of the church is our personal, our moment by moment, the people that we know and we love and we come into contact with, we, we see God's kingdom come there in our lives every day of the week where we go out and share what he's done with the people in our lives. This is why we're so passionate about church planting because it's our our job until Jesus comes back to go put these equipping stations called churches in all parts of the world that can then equip the saints for ministry, the church for ministry, and send us out to go do kingdom work, to see his kingdom come as will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're one example of that. 
we're a five-year-old uh, church plant, right? And, and our hope is to be involved in some way, some form or fashion, in other future church plants that will go to different parts of this city and beyond to do the same kind of thing, to see people come under God's gracious rule. And that's the third thing it leads to. There's the, it's a fulfillment of the promise. It's the job of the church. But it's also, uh, and this point speaks to, it's a mission, but it's a mission of conversion. Now, that word may or may not be associated with baggage for you. Uh, it was for me in many ways growing up. This idea of conversion, well, that's just what the church is about. They just want to, you know, proselytize people and convert them, and then they're gone. They pe- treat people like projects, not people, all that kind of stuff. Well, no matter if we've got baggage or not, this idea of conversion in the Bible is actually meant to be a good thing. At its heart, all it means is sharing that the good news of the rule of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that he has come, and that we have an opportunity now to submit to his good and gracious rule and be part of his eternal kingdom. I get to share about that this week with the junior high kids at the EDGE conference. I get to, they asked me to speak on as one of the seminars on how to share Jesus with your friends, and that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what that looks like, and uh, there, you know, there's all these different parts of sharing this gospel message. There's, you've got to know the gospel in order to share it, right? But you can't just share it you know, just by itself. You've also got to show. You've got to demonstrate that it's affected your life. So there's a know and show part. And then you, you can't just do it on your own. You've got to be dependent upon the Lord. So there's prayer. You've got to pray. But you can't just pray. You've also got to say something, right? You've got to You've got to speak. You've got to share words. And you've got to help people connect the dots of what the gospel, God's word says, and how that matters in real time to their life. And, and we tend to those different extremes. We, well, I'll just, I'll just, I like praying. I'll pray. And, and that's, that'll be my part. Well, no, we're also called to say. Or maybe you like saying, but you're trying to do it on your own strength, so you don't pray. Or maybe you like knowing a bunch, but you don't, your life doesn't show it a whole lot. You don't... Or maybe I would just write to show it, but you know, I don't want to have to study and actually learn it and know it. No, it takes all of those things in order to share, to, to be about the mission that God has called us to, to see God's kingdom reach every place. And it's, it's both global and it's local. Every street, every office, every gym, every school. I met these guys at this last week. I was at our denominational conference in Memphis, and I met these two guys. Uh, Jay Hager introduced me to them, and he said, these guys have been a part of a couple of different church planning networks, and, um, and then he, he introduced one of the guys. He said, this guy, I can't remember what country it was, um, but he's like, he's planted 70 churches in his country. And I'm like, all right, we're still working on one. Uh, but this idea of like unbelievable fruit, of the kingdom, 70 church, and he was younger than I was. And then this other guy was, it was, um, was part of this church planting network in Atlanta, and he was telling me about how they plant churches. And he said, it's really not rocket science. We go to a church, and we start prayer groups. And this group's praying on these days of the week, and then the leaders are getting together at this time, and they're praying, and then they're, everybody gets together at this time, and we pray, and we pray, and we pray, and we pray, and then God starts a church. And I was like... Like, it's not that simple. And he's just like, no, it kind of is. We get together with a church. We create this, this, this culture of prayer. We believe that the gospel is going forth, that his kingdom is coming and it's changing people's lives. And we see people coming to know the Lord. And when there's a, gr- a big enough group of them, we start a church with them. And I was just reminded of how callous I get, how um, d- discouraged I get, how... Little I tend to believe that this is true, that the kingdom is extensive. This is part of God's plan, and he will do it. It's not just extensive. It's intensive. It's intensive. It doesn't just reach every place, but it touches every part of God's creation. It touches every part of God's creation. The disciples had no idea, not just of how far it would go, but how deep and thorough the change would be. You see that in their interactions with Jesus all the time. They're, they're kind of like, okay, Jesus, you can mess with us over here, but don't touch this part. <laughs> I don't want you getting meddling over here in this part of my life. And Jesus was like, no, I care about that too. And I wanna, I'm going to meddle there because I want to see the, the gospel change, the change of the kingdom come throughout 
all of the areas of our lives. And so he gives another picture. He says, picture a lady who's working in her kitchen, and she's got flour and water and leaven, a little bit of leftover dough from last week, and a little bit of salt, and she mixes it all together, and the leaven goes throughout the whole big set of flour that she's got out there. Every particle of the dough is affected. It permeates the whole batter. The effects is felt throughout the lump of dough. And it's, it's a lot of flour here. It's, it's a little bit of leaven, but it's a ton of flour. From what uh, I read uh, as I studied, it can feed this, this, the, what she had set out could have fed at least 100 people. So it's a huge you know, chunk of flour she's making bread for. But she's got this little bit of leaven. All she does is mix it up, leave it, and come back, and it's worked itself throughout. It's permeated. You can't see it. You don't, you don't see that it's there, but you feel the effects. You taste the effects of it. You see it as you cook the bread. That's what he's talking about. The kingdom is there's every part of God's word and his world is going to be affected by the kingdom as it goes forth. Again, these three things, it's, it's part of the promise of old. Not only is it going to go to every place, but it's going to touch every part. The people of God, Adam and Eve, and the people that would go out to, to keep his commission in Genesis 1 and 2, were not only to go with, with, with the message of God, but they were to, to go with hearts changed by God. Um, they were to see the, the, the relationship with God work itself out in all the practices of their daily life, and where they spent their time, and, and, and how they did their job, in all of these different areas of their life. And again, they... They were called to cultivate, to positivize, to take God's raw materials and, and grow it, uh, do even better than what was there um, as they were cultivating God's good creation. And yet as, it's, as sin enters the world, really quickly in Genesis, you see them taking their skills, their, their gifts, the good things that God had given them, the raw materials, and instead of making uh, weapons for, I mean, uh, materials, items for cultivating, they were making weapons of war. So again, they're, they're, they're doing what we made to do, but they're just doing it with the corruption of sin. Instead of making items to cultivate God's creation, they're making weapons of war to, to fill the world with violence. And that's just showing us again that sin touches every part of our world. The structures are still good. God still made them, but we carry them in a, in a selfish, sinful direction instead of a Godward direction. And so God sets about from the promise of old to redeem his people. And in Isaiah 60, there's, a, there's this great picture in Isaiah 60 of these, um, these, these cultural artifacts, these cultural items known as the ships of Tarshish. All throughout the Old Testament, when the ships of Tarshish come up, they're always uh, the emblem of human pride. They, were, they would go out uh, afar and they'd bring back all of these you know, gold and um, you know, animals from other countries and all this kind of stuff so that they used to like, look, we can go anywhere, we can do anything, look what we can do. It was the, the emblem of, of human pride. So in Isaiah 60, earlier in Isaiah, God has said to the people of God, when I come to make all things new, when I come to, to enact my, my final judgment, I'm going to devote the ships of Tarshish to destruction because they are the emblem of human pride. You've taken the good materials of God and you've used them for sinful purposes. But then in Isaiah 60, they show up again and who's in them but the children of God that are being sped to the city of God. And you're like, how can he devote them to destruction? And yet they're showing up in the end, you know, in the end of all things, carrying the children of God to the city of God. Well, it's because that, that phrase, devote to destruction, means I'm going to break them of their sinful purposes that have been speeding people away from me. And I'm going to renew them, redeem them, reconcile them, and then use them for the purposes they were meant for in the first place. To speed people to my presence, to the city of God. That's what Jesus is doing when he's announcing the kingdom. He's saying, look, the promise from Genesis 1 and 2 to fill the earth, to go to every place, and also to touch every part of my creation, is now going to be fulfilled and come true because I'm here. I'm going to accomplish that salvation that's not just to see people come from death to life, to be spiritually awakened, although that's, that's a huge part of it, obviously. But then to, through their lives to touch every part of my world until I come and make all things new. It's the promise of, of old and it's the job of the church. 
The job of the church is to, to be about that, to see how the gospel of the kingdom touches every area of our lives and our neighborhoods and our world. That the, there should be no stone unturned there. When, a few years ago, we had um, a, a guy from a church in New York come and speak to us. And, and the, one of the things that stuck out of what he shared with us was that he said, hey, we, we talk a lot in church circles and in business circles of having a three-year vision. Or, um, a, a, you know, at least a, what, what are we going to do for the next 15 months or something like that. He said, I want to challenge you as the church to have a three-generation vision. In other words, think three generations of, ahead, and what would we want the nations to look like? Think three generations ahead, and think about what we would want the public school system to look like. Or whatever other area of culture, your job, area, the music industry in Nashville, whatever you want to put in that, 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 that blank there. Because he said you got to have a three-generation vision, because it didn't take, you know, it didn't take a minute to get to the point of complexity and sinful corruption that we're in now. It took years. And God's kingdom is going to take root, but it's going to take generations of people being faithful to see some of the things in our world turn around and more and more reflect the God that created it. That's how long sometimes change can take. And yet what other vehicle is equipped for it? Other than the church, who's got people from every tribe and tongue and nation, who's got people from every vocation and experience and background and gifting that could come together in a very real way, more than any other organization in the world, to say, hey, let's put our heart and our hands to that and see what kind of gospel kingdom change could come if the Lord's in it in our lifetime. It's the promise of old, it's the job of the church, and then thirdly, it's, it's not only a mission of conversion like we talked about with the extensiveness of the kingdom, but it's a, it's a mission of transformation as well. Um, yes, God calls us from death to life, but he also causes us to change of life. Jesus cares about every area of our lives, the boardroom, the backyard, the coffee shop. The kingdom of God, if it's at work, it'll change you. It'll root up and mess with every part of your life. It won't leave you alone. He won't leave you alone. He wants to see the gospel take root and change you. And then through you, he wants to see it change every part of your life. He wants to see your street look different. He wants to see your school look different. He wants to see the kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's where things are headed. So it's extensive and it's intensive. And then thirdly, and really briefly, it's upside down. It's different than we think. The kingdom causes us to rethink what is normal. And there's at least these three things that come out of this passage. Um, and they're not rocket science, but they are revolutionary. If, if, we, if it takes root in our life first, is this waiting in the Christian life is normal. Waiting is normal. Change takes time. And that can be frustrating um, but if you want to see real change in an area of your life and, and in the area of the world, then because the kingdom comes gradually, because it, it comes slowly at times, at some point in your life, you're going to have to put down roots. You're going to have to stay somewhere long enough to see it through, to see the change come. There's a, a documentary that we passed around when we first started the church called Godspeed. It's 20 minutes. You ought to look it up. You can watch it online anytime. And the, the short story is, is there's a, a pastor who's about to graduate seminary, and he talks to one of his mentors, and he said, what should, where should I look for a job? And he said, you need to go to St. Andrews, Scotland, and work there for a couple of years. And he's like, what's in St. Andrews, Scotland? He said, just go, and you'll see. So he trusted this guy. He went. And what it was was it was a small, slow Scottish community. And when he got there, he had his books, and he went to the church and asked about his office. And the guy's like, what are you talking about, office? That's your office. And he said, what do you mean? He said, well, I expect you to walk around and get to know everybody in our community. And just do it. Show up. Be faithful and watch what God will do. And so that's what he did for his couple of years there. And the idea was that's God's speed. It's, it's, it's one step at a time. One conversation at a time. You show up where God places you. You be faithful. And you see what he might do. 
That's how the kingdom comes. One person at a time. One conversation at a time. Being faithful where he's placed you. You want to know what God's got for you? What his plan for your life is? Think about what your week ahead brings. Where's he going to take you this week? Who's he going to bring you in the path of them? That's what he's got for you. That's how he can use you to see his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So waiting is normal. Secondly, small beginnings are normal. Small beginnings are normal. Look, he's promised fruit. And we want to run to that. But small beginnings are what's normal. We could do all sorts of bells and whistles to draw a huge crowd to events. I'm sure some of you are great event planners. We, we could do a bunch of stuff to get um, bottoms in seats. But that, that's, not what, that's not what the gospel is about. The gospel is about seeing people's lives changed. And, and that's more than just filling up a room. That's engaging people in real conversations in real over long periods of time to see and help them connect the dots of what God's word has to say for their real problems. Because what the God's word says is not just a good idea that we think about on Sundays. It's, 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 it's gospel for life to impact our daily lives. And that's the third thing is that transformation is normal for the Christian, for those who believe that there's a real God who's really at work in the world, transformation is normal. Um, the world tells us that that phrase that's used all the time that we, we tend to use, that, well, things are what they are. It is what it is. And the gospel comes along, the gospel of the kingdom says, when I look at things, I don't say it is what it is. I say, you know what? It's not what it will be. We start to see a potential for what God might do there. We look out at the things in our life. We expect people to be coming to the Lord. We expect them to be wakened by the Spirit in the same ways that we were. Sometimes when we weren't even looking for God and he showed up and invaded our hearts and our lives and changed us forever. We expect God to be doing that with people that we are in relationship with. So we have eyes of expectation to look to see well, how is he at work in that person's life? How can I fan that, that ember into a flame? We expect him to be transforming our workplaces. We expect him to use us to be um, kingdom light in those areas. We expect him to show up. And we expect it to be slow because the problem is much deeper than a lot of times we want to admit. But we expect it to be real and true. The last thing I'll share here is that there's this interesting phrase that we can miss. I missed it as I studied it the first time. But there's a, a phrase that alludes to the Old Testament that if you're an Old Testament scholar, you would have picked up on as you read verse 32, where Jesus says, It's the smallest of the seeds, but when it's grown, it's larger than all the garden plants, and it becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. That, that statement is just full, shocked full of Old Testament imagery, prophetic imagery. The prophets used that idea, that phrase of the nations, Babylon and Egypt, being these huge trees that all the, the nations could come rest in their branches because they were that powerful and mighty. And yet each one of those kingdoms over the years, as they rebelled against God, were, were were cut off in judgment. They didn't last. And so it's really ironic. The king of kings and the lord of lords comes here. And as he's telling the parable of the kingdom, he uses that imagery. And he's basically saying, look, there's a new kingdom afoot. And it's not like Egypt. It's not like Babylon. It's not like Assyria. It's not going to be cut off in judgment. And you're like, well, why? We're just as rebellious as they were. And the reason why it's not going to be cut off is because actually the king was cut off on our behalf, on behalf of those who would enter the kingdom. He, and he uses that language in Isaiah, he was cut off on our behalf. He died the death that we deserve so that we can enter into his kingdom, so that we can be a part of his extensive kingdom that will, uh, will last into eternity. And that we can see that kingdom come and 
transform every area of our lives and begin to take real transformative root in our world until he comes back and makes all things new. It's the parable of the mustard seed and leaven. It's a kingdom that reaches to every place. It's a kingdom that touches every part. And it's a kingdom that causes us to rethink what's normal. Let's pray. God, we need that. We need you to be at work in our lives in that way. We need to rethink what we think is normal. We need to have our expectations challenged and changed. Help us as we go throughout this week to be patient, knowing that uh, waiting is normal in the Christian life. Help us to not to despise small beginnings, but be grateful for them. And not to give up, but to be perseverant over the long term um, as we see you bear the fruit that you're going to bear. And help us to expect transformation. Yeah, slow, but real, true transformation in our own hearts, in our own lives, and in the world in which we live. And God, we pray, I pray, even for this summer, that we would taste some of that fruit, that we'd see some of that growth, um, that it would encourage our hearts to continue on being a part of seeing your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.